Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute of Justice. I'm James Wilson. A quarter of a century ago, the police in Cleveland, Ohio, broke into a woman's home and arrested her for possessing obscene pictures. The Supreme Court decided that the police had gathered the evidence used against her in a way that violated the Fourth Amendment. That amendment forbids unreasonable searches and seizures. The court's ban on the use of improperly obtained evidence became known as the exclusionary rule. Should an arrested person go free because the police gathered some evidence improperly? Or should any evidence be admissible in court so long as it is relevant to determining guilt or innocence? In 1984, the Supreme Court decided some cases in ways that modified the exclusionary rule. One of these began in Boston with the murder of a young woman. Well, the body of Sandra Bowie, who was the victim, was found in a field in Roxbury, and she was beaten on the head with a blunt object. Uh, she was then set on fire. Sandra Bulwer, a 29-year-old mother of two, was the 10th black woman found murdered in the Roxbury District of Boston, Massachusetts that year. Police investigating Bulwer's murder quickly focused on this man, Osborne Jimmy Shepard, a one-time boyfriend of the victim and the last person to be seen with her. Finding incriminating evidence in the car Shepard was driving, police obtained a warrant to search Shepard's home. In the basement, police found more evidence, the victim's blood-stained pantyhose, an earring, the same kind of wire that had been used on the victim, and in the backyard, a gasoline can. All of the evidence was eventually used up here in the courthouse in the, in the trial. He was convicted. But Shepard's conviction was overturned by a higher court. The reason? The police had used a faulty search warrant. The Massachusetts Supreme Court felt that uh, the warrant uh, alleged warrant used in the Shepard case was defective, defective and void. And as a result of that, the ensuing search was illegal and the items that were seized there under, uh, according to the law, should be suppressed. And they were. The three plurality more or less almost apologized uh, in their decision and said, we have no other alternative but to rule this evidence inadmissible under the present exclusionary rule of the Supreme Court of the United States. Detective O'Malley insists the police did everything by the book. The only problem, it was a Sunday afternoon and they couldn't locate the right search warrant form. Instead, they used one that said they could look for controlled substances, that is, drugs. So they changed the form and a judge who understood what they wanted made a few more changes. He said the warrant was now all right and signed it. The police believe they now had a valid warrant, but as it turned out, they didn't. We were able to get a judge. I went out, I explained it to the judge. I mean, what more do they want from a policeman? I'm not a lawyer, I'm a policeman. And I did everything right, so why should we or the Commonwealth or the victim's family be punished because of a piece of paper? The piece of paper that was used was not a valid warrant. That's a fact. Now, in order to get around that, you have to wink at that fact you have to say, well, that's all right, because whatever happened after that was done in a reasonable fashion, and therefore we're going to say it's okay. Those who support the exclusionary rule point to police misconduct that occurred before many states had to abide by the rule. Police officers in states where the exclusionary rule uh, did not exist were not asked how they got evidence, and uh, unreasonable searches were the norm. Uh, uh, police officers in New York City, where I was a cop, uh, in the narcotics division were required to make four narcotics arrests a month. And the way they would do that would be to cruise in neighborhoods, see someone who was funny looking, throw them up against the wall, conduct an unlawful search. If they obtained evidence, fine. They had a case in court. The judge would never ask them whether they had conducted an unlawful search because it didn't matter. 
The, a problem with that is you run into the question of how many people the police have to throw up against the wall to search in order to find the one who's carrying the dope. That kind of police behavior was made illegal in all states in 1961. The landmark decision was based on an incident that occurred in Cleveland, Ohio, at the home of Mrs. Dalry Mapp. The police officers came to her door. Uh, when she asked for a warrant, they waved a piece of paper in front of her, which turned out ultimately to be a bogus piece of paper and not a warrant at all. They ransacked her house. They manacled her to the, uh, to the stairwell, uh, and they went all through the house to see what they could find uh, without the benefit of any court paper or any authorization to invade her privacy. The police broke into Mrs. Mapp's home, displayed a document they claimed was a warrant, handcuffed her, refused to allow her lawyer to enter her house, and proceeded to search it. They were looking for a suspect in a bombing case and for some gambling materials. What they found was a trunk containing some obscene pictures. Retired police captain Carl DeLau was among those who conducted the search. There was nothing illegal in my way of thinking. On the existing laws of, of searching, there was nothing wrong. They found some crude drawings, uh, which they regarded to be obscene, and under the, the Ohio obscenity law at that time, um, the penalty was seven years for such an offense, and she was charged uh, with that offense. Mrs. Mapp was convicted and sentenced to prison for one to seven years. She appealed her case to the Supreme Court and won. The court held that states could no longer use evidence obtained without a proper warrant. If the police officers violated the Constitution, the evidence that they obtained from that violation was not to be used in evidence. Just changed our way of doing police work something unbelievable, and it slowed us down. The arrests were fewer. Attempts to modify the exclusionary rule were largely unsuccessful until 1984, when the U.S. Supreme Court heard the case of Jimmy Shepard. The court decided that since Detective O'Malley had been told by a judge that the search warrant was valid, the police had acted in good faith, and so the evidence they found could be used in court. Thus was created the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. What we now are going to do is we are going to modify the exclusionary rule and allow good faith to be a defense to the admissibility into evidence so that if the police officer did in fact use good faith that that evidence would be admitted the possibility exists that uh, general searches can be executed that uh, there will be no barrier uh, to keeping the police out of your homes joining me in the studio are yale Kamasar, professor of law at the university of michigan law school and Lowell Jensen, a former prosecutor in California, currently Associate Attorney General of the United States. Professor Kamisar, what are the principal justifications for the exclusionary rule? We just saw it, the Ohio officials saying, under existing law, the police didn't do anything wrong when they treated Ms. Maff the way they did. He thinks the exclusionary rule is the Fourth Amendment. Under existing law, it was a violation of the Fourth Amendment, a violation of the Ohio Constitution, he doesn't understand that the exclusionary rule has no bearing on the law of search and seizure. It only states the consequences of a violation of the law of search and seizure. Why then do we have the exclusionary rule? Isn't there some other way of protecting citizens' constitutional rights other than by excluding the evidence well, from the court? We, we have an exclusionary rule because the police act first. And uh, we have to examine what they did after the, after the event. Notice that in the MAP case, uh, Ms. Mapp's lawyer was prevented from getting into the house. Okay, now, if there was some way to test the legality of the search in advance, we wouldn't have an exclusionary rule. But we can't notify the, the suspect that we're about to search him or about to arrest him. So it must be done after the event. All the exclusionary rule is, is an opportunity to test the legality of a search or seizure at some stage in the criminal process in an adversary way. Now, now uh, I, I believe that, that uh, the attack on the exclusionary rule is really an attack on the Fourth Amendment itself, because if there was some way, some effective alternative to the exclusionary rule, a taught remedy, self-discipline, the police simply would not violate the Fourth Amendment in the first place, and they'd lose the same number of cases. You see, I mean, society will always pay a price the same price whether there's, there's an alternative to the exclusionary rule or not. The price will be fewer convictions. The only time society will not pay a price is if it converts the Fourth Amendment into an unenforced honor code and pays no attention to it. It's my understanding that most other nations of the world, including many we think of as democratic and free, such as England and Australia and New Zealand, 
uh, do not use an exclusionary rule. Uh, are people's liberties in greater jeopardy there than here? Most other nations of the world don't have the First Amendment, don't give newspapers and TV the same freedom. Most nations of the world don't have the same separation of church and state. We are the only nation in the world with the Fourth Amendment. Secondly, we have a different history. Uh, other nations of the world, uh, the police seem to be better disciplined. There seems to be tighter organization on top. Uh, there seems to be a, uh, we, we have a history of, uh, of race uh, tension, of great pressure uh, because of the crime rate. Uh, uh, all I can say is that, that uh, each nation has its own problems, and, and the fact that uh, uh, we're the only nation in the world with the exclusionary rule does not seem to be uh, dispositive because we're the only nation in, 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 in the world with a Bill of Rights and all kinds of protections that other nations don't have. Are you saying that in countries such as England, the police can uh, search and seize evidence uh, without uh, a search warrant? Uh, all I know is that I, what I read about other countries, they say that the police are better disciplined, the prosecutors uh, exert a command function, in Canada, for example, uh, tort remedies are more effective. Excuse uh, me, a tort remedy is what? Well, uh, that, that suits against the police or, or the entity or the government mm -hmm. entity for violating someone's rights are more effective. They're more mm -hmm. meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, now, even, even the leading critics of the exclusionary rule, such as James Schlesinger and Dallin Oaks, do not make that argument. They say that uh, other countries have different histories, different problems, and it seems to me significant that they are, I mean, some critics make that argument, others do not. Uh, and and I, I would just say, uh, if we want to compare other countries, there are all kinds of civilized countries that don't have any of the Bill of Rights we have. Uh, 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 for example, uh, the newspapers can't do anything approaching what they can in, in, in England, anything approaching what they can do in, in this country. No other country in the world feels that strongly about keeping church and, and, and state separate. So wh why pick on the Fourth Amendment? Right. Uh, do you think the exclusionary rule since 1961 has changed police behavior? Do you think there are fewer improper or unreasonable searches and seizures as a result of that rule than there well, were? There's no doubt that the exclusionary rule had a tremendous impact on the police. Uh, we, 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 we need look no further than the response of the leading police officials. The, 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 the police commissioner of New York said it created a tidal wave and an earthquake. The prosecutors in Philadelphia said it was a hurricane. It, it revolutionized uh, police practices. Well, what does that mean? It means that until the exclusionary rule was imposed, until it mattered whether you violated the Fourth Amendment or not, the police were not paying any attention to the law of search and seizure. They were not being trained in the law of search and seizure. Uh, that, it seems to me, is the only conclusion one can draw from the way all these police officials react. It's just as if the, the Fourth Amendment had been written. Does it worry you at all that the exclusionary rule, as uh, commonly understood, seems to make no distinctions? That it, that it can release both the murderer and the pickpocket, that it applies both to minor and major errors by the police. It seems to be a guillotine. Well, uh, that, that's a problem, but that's true of all our rights. It's true of the right of confrontation, uh, the right to counsel. I mean, uh, uh, confessions, uh, no distinction between murderers who confess and minor criminals who confess. I would say this, that the great bulk of cases involving the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule are drug cases, concealed weapons, gambling. We saw the Shepard case, a murder case. Now, that's a, that's a very, very unusual case. A, a recent study, a five-year study of California cases concludes that something like six hundredths of one percent of homicide cases are lost because of the exclusionary rule. So uh, we don't have murder cases uh, very often. We, we almost never have murder cases. Uh, that, that's a problem, but it seems to me that, that rights generally other rights generally, the, the privilege against self-incrimination, the right to counsel, the right of competition, none of these rights turn on whether it's a major crime or a minor crime. Mr. Jensen, yeah. uh, if you had been uh, on the Supreme Court at the time that Dalry Maps came up, uh, case came up in 1961, would you have excluded the evidence that the police gathered in that case in Cleveland? Uh, I, well, let me do it in this fashion, if I may. I think it might be useful to go back and put it into a context as to what decision was necessary to make at that time. Uh, the Fourth Amendment does not articulate an exclusionary rule. The Fourth Amendment exists on its own terms, and so that an exclusionary rule is independent of the Fourth Amendment. It's simply 
a remedial action that was fashioned by the courts, and they fashioned it not only in the Mapp case, but it had first come into existence in the Weeks case in 1914. I think it's, it's important to remember that what the courts were doing was saying to themselves that we need to have some sanction that can be imposed by the courts to deter police misconduct, and they fashioned that rule. It's a judicially promulgated rule of evidence. It is not something that is required by the Constitution. That's been made very, very clear by the courts. So that in making the decision as to whether or not the MAP case should be decided to exclude the evidence, you would have to say to yourself, do I feel there are no other alternatives rather than using this uh, judicially promulgated rule in order to exclude that evidence? I can understand why the court did it. I might have done it in those, those terms. But I think that's very important in terms of uh, realizing what our context is. That's what the court was doing, fashioning a rule of evidence. Well, let, let's suppose that we all want to guarantee the Bill of Rights, and we all in particular want to prevent unreasonable searches and seizures. What feasible alternative is there to the exclusion exclusionary rule as a way of preventing people from having their homes broken into and searched. Well, one thing we ought to remember also is that the decisions that have now been uh, promulgated, promulgated by the Supreme Court do not do away with the exclusionary rule. There's sometimes a feeling that oh, suddenly the rule has disappeared. The rule has simply been articulated in such a fashion to make it uh, true to its purpose and true to its rationale. So the exclusionary rule still exists, and it's still a remedy that the courts use in order to deter police misconduct. Uh, you could have other alternatives. Professor Kamisar talked about some penalty against a policeman directly. The you know, exclusionary rule is really a rather curious kind of result where you have what is an offense, at least a, a, what appears to be an offense by a criminal offender, and then an offense by a policeman, and we say to ourselves we're going to punish neither in the sense that we now say the evidence can't be used and we will now not convict the criminal offender and we will now use a rule to punish the police by a general deterrence of their future conduct by excluding evidence. You're saying that the police officer who searched improperly and the prosecutor who introduces the evidence they are not punished by the exclusionary rule. What it happens They're punished in the sense that society that the is case. punished because the case is lost. And we now have a situation in what is now being accomplished by the, as I say, the making the rule true to its purpose in the recent cases, the Shepard case and then the Leon case that were decided by the court, is that you have to remember that the cost to society is in the failure of the truth-finding function in the courtroom itself. So that any time we have a failure to have our court produce the truth in his courtroom, we, we have a miscarriage of justice. Uh, we also have disrespect for our system when we cannot produce the truth by relevant, reliable evidence, and the exclusionary rule serves that purpose. It just removes that evidence from the courtroom process. Well, so what, what changes would you favor, if any, in the exclusionary rule to make it serve this purpose better? Well, I, I favored exactly what the court did in this sense, in that what had happened... In the Shepard case. In the Shepard case, the Leon case, what the court did was finally face up to the, uh, the situation where the exclusionary rule had gradually gone to the point where it was reaching situations where there was no police misconduct. If you go back and look at the cases that were before you in, in here, we, it was very, very clear, and you go back to MAP, what the court was concerned about was police misconduct. Now, if you look at Shepard, there was no police misconduct. As the officer said, he did precisely what everyone would expect him to do. That's what happened in the Leon case. The court uh, received evidence, that is, a magistrate received information from police officers, then issued a search warrant, and there was then a disagreement about the courts on whether or not that information had been sufficient. There had been no police misconduct. Now, to use a rule to exclude evidence on a rationale that it's going to deter police misconduct when there has been no police, police misconduct is foolish. What about uh, other implications? Suppose uh, we want to prevent police misconduct. Uh, suppose we entertain the so-called good faith exception. If the police officer has acted in good faith, will allow the evidence to be admissible even if there was a technical error. Doesn't that rule require us, in cases generally, to try to estimate the subjective state of the police officer? What motivated him, what he believed was true? Can the no. courts really do that? Well, the, the court is being asked not only to look at a subjective state of mind of the police officer, but the court, under the rules that's been adopted by the Supreme Court in Shepard and Leon, is to look at the objective state of the law. A police officer may not make himself ignorant and then go ahead and do something against known and articulated rules and get away with it. That won't be permitted at all. The police officer still has to live by the objective rules. But when there's a situation such as occurred in Shepard and Leon where the police obeyed the rules and conducted themselves in such a fashion there was no misconduct, then what the courts have said, there shall be no exclusion. 
But if the police uh, follow the rules, and if the rules in your view are so complex as to make uh, the burden on society great when cases that are important are lost to the prosecutor, isn't it a fact then that the good faith exception really doesn't modify the exclusionary rule very much? All it makes clear is that uh, if the officer follows the rules, uh, then we'll allow the evidence to be admitted. But it doesn't say anything about the quality of the rules. Are you worried about the character or the complexity of the rules themselves? Well, the, in, in the situation that has now been uh, adopted by the courts, uh, the, both the situations where mm -hmm. there's Shepard involved a search warrant, so that what you have is a policeman going to the court and the court as a neutral detached magistrate considering the information given to them and issuing a search warrant, which then directs the officer to go and conduct a search. Now, under those situations, I don't see anything about the, the good faith e exception mm -hmm. that is a problem or should uh, give us any pause. There are another area of cases that perhaps are more difficult, and that are the cases where searches are conducted without a warrant. Uh, there are specifically uh, articulated areas of the law where the court contemplates that the officer can search without a warrant. Now, in that area where the rules are promulgated, it's very important that the rules are clear. So the police want to follow the rules. They mm -hmm. want to be able to take action that will then be sustainable in court. That's an area where I think the, uh, there will be discussion, and I think we'll see the courts moving into the same sort of definition, that where the officer has objectively and within the, the rules that are there, behaved himself and has not misconducted himself, then I think that we'll also see an expansion to a good faith, reasonable exception. Professor Kamazar, Mr. Jensen has suggested that the way the exclusionary rule operates imposes a cost not on the police officer or on the prosecutor, but on society in large because a case is lost. Do you agree with that assessment? I would say that the, uh, the Fourth Amendment imposes the cost on society, not the exclusionary rule. If, if the police know that in, in 10 of 100 homes there is contraband mm -hmm. and, and, they, and someone tells them you can't do it, you haven't got probable cause, they don't search any of those 100 homes, they comply with the Fourth Amendment, 10, of, 10 cases were lost, they don't know which case. If instead the police search all 100 homes, they find contraband in 10 homes and the evidence is thrown out, they're back where they started. I mean, if they had obeyed the, the Fourth Amendment in the first place, they would have lost the same cases they lost by violating the Fourth Amendment in the first place. Only we wouldn't know the names of the defendants and we wouldn't be able to hold the evidence in our hand. That's the only difference. So, so it seems to me that, that, that uh, it is the Fourth Amendment itself, not the exclusionary rule, that, that is imposing the costs on society. Now, if I can go back to the Shepard case, I agree. I agree uh, with Mr. Jensen. Uh, there was no police misconduct in the Shepard case, and I hate to see that case as the battleground for the exclusionary rule. I would have let the evidence in. There was no reason, no need to get to a good faith exception. Uh, the police had probable cause. They described the evidence they were searching for. It was an oddball case, and it seems to me that, that it's unfortunate that so much of the, uh, the country has, has, has uh, so much of the media treatment has dwelt on that case. Well, if I could just interrupt you, the, yeah. the Massachusetts Supreme Court said that they were bound by the U.S. Supreme Court's rulings on the exclusionary rule. The Massachusetts Supreme Court is known as a relatively progressive court. Uh, if you think the case should not have been thrown out in the first instance, why did the Massachusetts Supreme Court say that it had to be thrown out? Uh, that's a good question. I can only guess that they said it with a smile. They said, this is a wonderful case for adopting a good faith exception. We couldn't have made up a better one. And, uh, I mean, after all, this is, uh, this is a case that ought to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I can only say that the leading authorities on search and seizure, such as Wayne LaFave, who was the author of the leading treatise, have, are all saying that a resourceful state court could have let that evidence in and said under the circumstances the police officer w was, was acting pursuant to the affidavit which spelled it out. There was no reason, no need to get to a good faith exception. Sure, the good faith exception looks very palatable in a situation where you don't need it. Do you agree well, with that, well, Mr. No, no, I don't. Uh, this illustrates very, uh, I think very well, is that Unfortunately, the court did do that. The court did throw out the evidence and did reverse the conviction under the circumstances we actually saw. And that raises precisely what I was saying about the cost to society. You've now had the, the specter of a verdict which is false. You've had disrespect for the court system that's built into that kind of decision making. And it would have been left alone had it not gone to the Supreme Court. It would have been all over. The Supreme Court would have said, with all that uh, Professor Camisar has said about what they ought to have done, they, they would not have done that. They would have left that in such a situation 
case reversed. And yeah, but that, take the Matt case. Take the Matt case. If they hadn't violated her rights in the first place, they wouldn't have found the evidence. But under the rules that now exist on the Matt case, as I understand it, you would have, if you, at least if you'd had a situation where the Matt case now had the articulated rules that police know, you would have an illegal search. You would have exclusion. You would have police misconduct. Now, the whole point is you've got to keep coming back to, do the police misconduct themselves? That's what the rule is for. And when they do not misconduct themselves, there's no reason that we should pay that social cost. Well, fine. We, we aren't arguing about the exclusionary rule. We're arguing about the law of search and seizure. I agree. Whenever, whenever you say the police violated the Fourth Amendment, they shouldn't be allowed to use the evidence. Now we're fighting about what constitutes misconduct. That's a fight over the content of a law of search and seizure, not over the exclusionary rule. And, and, and that's an entirely different issue. I'm simply saying saying that every time you properly exclude the evidence because the police violated the law, you're only putting them back where they would have been in the first place and saying you're no better off than the police department who obeyed the Fourth Amendment in the first place. It's What's my, wrong with that? It's my sense that the public in general, perhaps because they do not understand the issues, becomes very upset when they learn that a case against what appears to be a patently guilty person is thrown out because uh, the police uh, did not give him uh, the so-called Miranda warnings, you have a right to a lawyer, and so forth, or did not search uh, his effects uh, properly or with a warrant. Uh, uh, setting aside how many actual cases that are lost, and assuming for the moment, mm -hmm. which I think is correct, that it involves relatively few serious homicides and the like, uh, should we worry about the fact that people believe that the courts are working against them because they seem to be elaborating such a complex array of, uh, of technical rules to judge the admissibility of evidence? Is that a problem in your mind? The technical rules uh, seem to me are, are, are much the, as, as much the fault of the police as anybody else. They're pushing as far as they can go. They're not getting search warrants. They're not giving Miranda warnings. And so the courts try to bail them out. It seems to me if I were in charge of the police department, the rules would be very simple. I'd say get a search warrant uh, whenever practical. I'd say give the, give the Miranda warnings whenever practical. You have to realize how these cases come up. The police are stretching as far as they can, and the courts are trying to bail them out. Now, it seems to me, sure, people get upset when you lose a case because people believe in, in fairness in, in the abstract. They don't believe it in the concrete. We say, what makes our country better than other countries? Uh, uh, we're a democratic country. We're a free society. You can't break into someone's house. You can't stop someone without probable cause. We believe that on Law Day and the 4th of July. But we, we, we don't want to see how the rule bites. When we actually lose a case, we actually see a heroin dealer going free, it hurts. But that's the way it is. I mean, if you really believe in the Fourth Amendment, obviously you're going to lose some cases. I think we're going to have to end at this point. Thank you for joining me in the audience. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me in the studio. For Crime File, I'm James Wilson. program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. This program was produced by the Police Foundation, which is solely responsible for its content.